Peace all. We're live with D Labrie. We're going to be uh, streaming all the way from the other side of the world today. So we have D Labrie with us for um, streaming all the way from Seattle, Asia. So uh, stick around. We're going to play a video to get started and we'll be uh, live in just a moment here. We're live. This song is dedicated to all the folks in the struggle. My grandmother, Mandy Bell Dixon, my auntie, Samantha. You know what I'm saying? Everybody that's doing it and trying to make it. You know what I'm saying? Let's do this. Yo, yo. Yo, this ain't coming from nobody special, but don't give up, dog, cause I ain't gonna let you. No need to lecture, life is gonna stress you and test you. But like Pac, I bet you, you can get knowledge, respect the scholars. Peep the text in Malcolm X's autobiography, or the great Bob Marley's discography. Ruth Saga G, that was college to me. It taught me that this country ain't giving no apologies for hanging black folks like apostrophes. Honestly, the just bothers me. African-American policy, democracy, hell no, not for me. I'm a king, but these cops try to ride me. Kill another, probably me. First cup in my head, making my own bed. Now even times believe whatever it said, it's not. Peaches and cream in the ghetto, reaching for a dream. Diamonds and fame is not as sweet as it seems. Easy to achieve without stumbling, falling, getting back up, walking, toy balling. I wish these suckers give a room. Eating with my hands, didn't have a silver spoon. Hard to understand the simple thoughts of a fool. Or a reputable caught without a tool. Live life without rules, regulations, and boundaries. Top of the game now, support my family. Check for convo and expect the temptation. Dealer Brent Quinn wrecking the nation. Pressure makes diamonds, pressure bust pipes. Pressure on the rock, I'ma show you the light. Trying to get to the top, just wanna see you. I know you can't stop. Stick to the plot. So what you gon' do then? I'ma make it. So what you gon' do then? Take care of them kids. So what you gon' do then? Stand and defend. LeBron San Quinn got plans to win. And I can't pretend I don't feel the pain or feel the strain. Will sunshine kill the rain? Cause this dark cloud follows me. Would a hood just swallow me? We all grow up in poverty. Only properties and anomaly. Ask Grandma LeBron on Holly Street. We can't get over the hump like black eyed peas with this crab in the bucket mentality. So I'ma just sit back, stack these G's, get back to the sea. Get back to the street, spit back to the beat. That's yours to keep. Feel more to the D. Get though, don't sleep. Trying to get to the top. Just want to see you. But no, you can't stop. Stick to the plot. Till we motherfuckers get head right. Come on. Good me, man. Trying to get to the top. Want to see you. But no, you can't stop. Stick to the plot. Till we motherfuckers get head right. Go, go. 
your place, just get into it. You don't want to, but you got to do it. No need to hate, just keep it moving. This is the way we keep it grooving. It's day to night and that's a moment. You be you and I'ma be me too. And we can make paper from the book. Then the bring it in quick, well, I thought you knew it. I guess they thought we'd sit idly wanted a piece of the pot. Keeping our hands down, cause we was never reaching the sky. Break out the hoses so we know we need to stay in our places where they dangle this American dream in our faces. Only way to get on was do mammies and black faces. We ain't bringing in the th- when we catch the cases. The history was complicated, but the plan was basic. Everybody get this money on some whatever it takes. Play lotto, sell, sex, sell, drug, sell, soul. Still call ourselves niggas, cause that's all it knows. So much rage and passion in us that we don't take. We lack the wisdom and patience of previous generations. But we the kids of the Panthers on some independent people. Roses from the concrete history in the making. And you can't escape this, cause if I'm contagious. Yeah, they had our ancestors, but we got their kids. So we press on, keep rising, regardless of what they did. It ain't easy, but it's necessary or else they win. We got strength woven into every fiber of our spirit. So break cycles, break statistics, and fight with your pen. Heart to God, head to God, cause love comes from within. This is just a message from Kiana, D. LaBrie, and San Quinn. I want to give a shout out to hip hop's greatest, Tupac Shakur. You know what I'm saying? And Richie Rich for the inspiration on the hook. This how we doing it though. Yeah. You know what I mean? Shout out to everybody that ever struggled with their blood, sweat, and tears. Black History Month is short as month, but we gonna keep it moving. You know what I'm saying? The Black Panthers, Oakland, hey, the whole Bay. No. Revolutionaries worldwide. Keep it moving. Keep it moving. Forward. Work to get what you got. Hey, hey, how's it going? How's it going? Hello, everybody. Hello to the whole world. I want to want to say uh, I'm really, really thankful to be in your presence right now. Um, I'm kind of new to doing the live thing. I'm not really big on the live thing. Uh, I love it, but I'm not I'm not really well versed in it. I have done a few workshops like this. Uh, I have done some uh, some uh, online meetings and I have done a lot of uh, I have done a few shows online, like since the pandemic. So just just to show uh, my appreciation, shout out to Auburn Hip Hop Congress and shout out to everybody tuning in. Um, welcome to my second office. This is actually my uh, my, my home office in uh, Korea. I'm not actually in Seoul, I'm a little outside of Seoul, but um, I didn't get to make it to my main office because uh, I had a couple of runs to make last night and. Uh, I had to send my kids off to the dentist. So today I'm in my home office. I was in here for two weeks for quarantine. I got here a little bit before Halloween. Uh, Let me close my door real quick. So welcome, welcome. And thank you for checking out my video. Um, That was called It Ain't Easy. It's a video I did. uh, It was actually my first big video. And uh, one of my mentees did the directing. His name is Michael Jordan Payton, and I consider him like a little brother. He he actually was one of the people who kind of kind of monitored and, and ran San Francisco State Hip Hop Congress, somewhat of a representative there. He graduated from there, and he did that video for me. And now he's working for Murder, Inc., Live Nation. Uh, he worked for Governor uh, Newsom. He worked for Kamala Harris, and uh, he's doing big things now. So I thank him for doing that video. The reason uh, I asked my, my brother Rocky, shout out to Rocky, shout out to Natalie, um, I asked him to show that video is because it's a good example of exactly what I try to represent as an artist and what I try to represent. Uh, I'm reading some notes because I'm just trying to make sure y'all can see me. Can everybody see me? I don't know if there's a chat room or whatnot. I'm checking Rocky's notes to just make sure. Yeah, it looks like he hasn't sent me anything saying I'm, I'm not online or whatever. So, uh, hey, what's up? Uh, is that Kobe Francis? How you doing? Um, so check it out. Uh, that video is a good example of what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, I, I, over time, I started calling myself, on a side note, the hip-hop sociologist. And uh, it's a reason for that. Part of why I, I went there is because, to be quite frank, uh, hip-hop saved my life in a lot of ways. It saved my life, and it actually 
in a sense, has been my life since a child, really. And uh, it really even got deeper and deeper all the way up to adulthood as of now. And so, uh, you know, part of the reason I'm even able to be in Korea or be anywhere and travel the world, tour, make music, uh, write, create, and even part of my education process was hip hop. Um, it sounds kind of cliche to say now, but when we was growing up, you know, hip hop was still kind of new. Um, it was not something that, like now, we could somewhat take it for granted because it's there. It's part of our, it's part of our everyday, like, uh, <laughs> like a microwave or like a cell phone. Like back in the days, we didn't have those cell phones and the texting and all that. So um, I have a thing where, I, as a, as as a reason, I started calling myself a hip hop sociologist because. One of the things uh, that, that really touched me in life as far as education, of course, was hip hop. But part of it was um, sociology when I, when I finally got the guts to go to college and uh, take sociology, which I got an A plus in, even though uh, I think the first few times I took it, I was actually touring and doing music. So I didn't get to finish the final. So I actually had to take it over a couple of times, but I was really close with the teacher. And this was in San Jose, De Anza College. I actually fell in love with, with sociology because I think that everything we do, you know, there's a lot of debates on this and that, geography, uh, <clears throat> you know, music, race, culture, uh, you know, astronomy, uh, religion, politics. All of these things are uh, tied together through sociology, social. You know what I'm saying? It's a social social study. So we're looking at how things connect, how they work together, not just how one thing works by itself, not just how rap works by itself, not just how, you know, uh, one culture works by itself, not just rap as just music, but like sociology ties it all together. So I think uh, for me, hip hop has always been a great, example it's a microcosm of how sociology works because you have regional aspects you have uh you know local viewpoints you have cultural views in hip-hop you have uh, different religions in hip-hop you have people from different places different languages different slangs um, different topics um different eras you know what i'm saying like i'm i'm in, I'm, I'm i'm from a, a sports family too so I'm actually from a, a, a long line of athletes and uh, and uh, four generations in Oakland. So I got a lot of history with uh, sports, music, art, politics, activism, education is a big part of my upbringing. And I mirror and parallel all that through hip hop. And it's been the best way for me to help the world and be able to connect with people, express my ideas and kind of, uh, I, I say, provide something to the world. It's been a vehicle for me. And I believe that that's why hip hop has been so powerful. It gave a lot of that voice to the voiceless. And so uh, that's what I kind of want to talk about. That's kind of what my workshop is about. It's kind of what I'm more passionate about as opposed to uh, like when people think a lot of times when we were starting hip hop Congress, people thought of when we would go to schools, we would say, yo, we want to do hip hop workshops. And they would assume it was all we were trying to teach kids to rap or teach kids to be rappers. And this is a funny, I'm going to just give a little bit of history. Rocky said I got about 30 minutes, but I'm going to give y'all as long as y'all want because uh, I, I really like to build. I wish I could talk back and forth with y'all. But, um, you know, so anyway, I'll just give a little history on me before I get into some concepts because I could go on and on about this. So, like I said, first of all, I'm in Yongin, Korea, uh, about... 30, 40 minutes south, or yeah, about south, south of uh, Seoul. And uh, this is my home office, two week quarantine. I've been coming here for a long time. Uh, I've been coming to Asia on a hip hop level for the early, for about close to 20 years. I said about 15 plus years, I've been coming out here doing music, um, promoting music, meeting people, doing shows, touring. Okay, yeah, he said we got up to an hour. Got you, man. Uh, so I'm about probably 10 minutes in, but, you know, uh, y'all free to hit me anytime and, and tap in. We can keep this going. But uh, so basically, um, 
I came out here for some Halloween events, and I'm gonna be out here till 2021. So I I, I came to start it off with some Halloween shows. I, I tend to come here uh, once or twice a year. I have an office here for my record company. Uh, uh, I'm starting some things for Hip Hop Congress here, but I've been coming here for a long time. And a lot of times people ask me, well, "Why are you here? Why are you in South Korea? Why are you in Asia? Why would you come to?" you know, these places or why do you work with artists in these different areas or or I might go to a place even like I've been in, in Nevada City, Grass Valley area and people's like, well, what's going on out here or why? Or I might be away from the clubs out there and somebody like, why, why are you here? Like, what's, where's rap here? And what one thing is hip hop is everywhere because it's in us. It's, it's amazing that it's spread like it has, but it's it's part of us. It's inside of us. Like one time they asked the homie Most Deaf, they said, well, what's, where's hip hop going? If y'all heard the album both, uh, Black on Both Sides at the end or maybe the intro, it says, where's hip hop going? And uh, he said, the answer is it's up to us. Where are we going? Who are we going? So whenever I go, wherever I go, I bring hip hop with me. I take it with me. It's in me. It's in us. It's in Auburn. It's in hip hop. It's in Auburn Hip Hop Congress, and that's a big part of what Hip Hop Congress was. Um, you know, trying to unite regions, trying to connect hip hop artists, hip hop culture in different areas. So, uh, just a little bit of background. My name's D. Labrie. Uh, stands for Love and Beauty Resides in Everyone, and Lies and BS Revolve in Everyday Life. So that's uh, what I consider the positive and the, ne the negative, the balance. And I'm also a Libra, so that's part of who I am and how I like uh, vision the world. So it kind of plays a role in everything I do as an artist and an activist. And it's how I um, kind of connect with the, with the game. So uh, my nickname, they called me, my, my old manager gave me this nickname a long time ago called Mr. Network. Uh, I was living in San Jose. My, my old manager was like a Suge Knight. He was a buff, tough guy, man. Really couldn't. He could put hands on somebody bad. Like, he was a good guy, African guy. I mean, uh, and he took me under his wing, and he used to take me to studios and say, you know, put me in the in the, in the the shark tank with, with uh, different rappers, put me, throw me in shows with different artists. And he would be like, yo, you seem to get along with everybody. You seem to know everybody. And so he called me Mr. Network. He said, you're like a Mr. Network. So it kind of stuck as a nickname. But the funny thing is, uh, at the time, and I think this is important to the sociology topic or the topic of hip hop, is that we tend to think of stuff in, in how we see it when we, when we find it. Or uh, if you're a visionary like myself, you kind of might vision something and see what it can be, a potential. So like I mentioned how when we started, hip hop was just a fun thing we did in the hood. It wasn't this huge thing that the world knows. And like, I even got friends, like I got a lot of friends that's hip hop legends older than me, like Akil from Jurassic Five. You know, uh, I was one of the early people bring him through the Auburn area, Sacramento area to, I mean, he's been around the world as, as Jurassic Five and all that, but I, I brought him through once he did a workshop. But we've had a lot of interesting topics on, on top, discussions on tour. He mentioned uh, to me that, you know, he's been around, he's older than me, he's from South Central LA. He mentioned to me that he was around before hip hop was called hip hop. I want you to take that in for a second. There's rappers and people alive. And, and of course we got our elders and stuff, but there's rappers who still rapping that you still listen to that, uh, you know, still fan favorites that were there and was around listening when rap, when hip hop was not even called hip hop yet. So just keep that in mind as we he had, that's the kind of conversations I want to have with y'all because sometimes I get in trouble because I said, I might not, uh, there's a lot of popular narratives in hip hop. And I want you to think of everything I'm talking about and let's not just apply it to hip hop. Cause that's a big issue. You know, I always say when in doubt, blame hip hop, hip hop is a huge scapegoat. And I believe part of that is because the people who created it or, or poor from the hood, Black people, people of color, people with, with no voice, people with no music programs, people who had to make up their own way, be, you know, beating on the table. Like we used to beat on the table at, at, at school. We beatboxing, you know, no instrument. You know, like we maybe people couldn't afford the violin class. You know what I'm saying? They couldn't afford the piano lessons. So um, one big thing with Hip Hop Congress was we was like, we want to, now that the world loves hip hop and wants to, 
tap into hip hop and use it in commercials and use it for politics and use it for every little thing you could think of to make things cool. We was like, why aren't hip hop artists from underground to famous getting, you know, brought in to be the teachers, the official voices and uh, lecturers and, you know, professors, like just like somebody would come in and teach the uh, guitar or, you know, t you know, there's a lot of in, in richer areas, rock programs and things like that. So anyway, uh, back to the beginning, I came in as a, the, I came in as, as a little, as a kid, kind of growing up in music and uh, growing up in Oakland, you know, it's the home of the Black Panthers. My mom was involved in the Black Panthers. Uh, my mom was just, did, did uh, a lot of things that you would see uh, as a, as you know, when we think of hip hop, and that's one of the topics I have. I'm not gonna. I got a little. Thing, I got a little information, but it's. I don't know if y'all can really see it, but I got a few topics I want to. I want to write up. I remind me of, of like a ghetto version of my my teacher from back in the day when he would just write these different topics. But some of them are. One of them is the topic I was talking about the topic of hip hop, but also the uh, the word hip hop. So one thing. One narrative we're going to talk about right now, and it, it, it might help you in the future, because I've heard it all, man, the term hip hop. So some people, you know, I've sold CDs and done shows everywhere from the suburbs to the uh, hoods to the overseas where people don't speak English to, to areas that don't even like rap, don't even like black people, you know, all kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, I've heard it all. So sometimes some people will ask me when I, when I walk up, with a CD, here's my new sampler of my new album, Mr. Network 2. Um, they would say, well, is it, what kind of, what kind of, I say, they say, what is it? I say, it's hip hop. So they would say, well, what kind of hip hop? Like, and it's funny to me to hear it, just like when I say something that's my OGs, like Percy P or Akil, Jurassic 5, or, you know, uh, my homie from Dead Prez, M1, they, they look, they might look at me and laugh at something I think as a younger artist. But it's like, what's hip hop? What's rap? And it to and and what I've changed. I used to be like a, a hip. -hop, I call myself a hip hop. Uh, what's the word? Uh, elitist. Like I was a lyric, all about lyrics and judging people and 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 knowing the answer. And I've changed a lot. I've grown a lot. Now my answer to that question, when they say what kind of hip hop is, I ask, well, what do you mean? How do you see hip hop? because I can't always answer for somebody else, but I can give you a basic definition. So uh, I remember one time I was in uh, Central Valley near uh, Stockton, and I met this woman, a younger white woman with her kids, and I was trying to sell her a CD, or maybe I was just talking to her and I mentioned I had a CD, and we started talking. She, she said, well, what kind of hip hop is it? And I said, what's hip hop to you? She said, well, well hip hop, I think, is more like more like, uh, you know, music on the radio and like, you know, it's more hip and it's more popular. And rap is more like hardcore with a message. And so it was like, okay, okay, I hear you. So then we had a conversation. I said, well, typically, you know, hip hop would be the culture, the bigger culture, you know what I'm saying, of the whole thing. Like it's a harder concept to really understand unless you live it or in it or really want to hear it from someone who can teach it to you. It's something you got to kind of go dive into. Sociology-wise, hip-hop, you can study. Like, I remember even early days when I met KRS and he took me on the road. He told us in his lecture that he was talking about hip-hop as in comparison to, like, almost like a religion. To some, it's almost like a religion because it has rules and customs, but there's no spiritual God or whatever in the, involved. But some people might see. It's like they call Rakim the God MC or whatever. So, um what I'm saying is uh, hip hop generally, we're gonna say it's the, it's the culture at large. With, for a hip hop head, it's easy to understand kind of what that means. You might, like I, I might walk through the city st streets of Seoul and somebody walks up to me, see me dressed like this and they like, and they see a CD in my hand or they see this flyer, like this, this is my new single, uh, I shot this video in Japan and I, I, and I might hand them a CD that like hip hop, like, and then they do a little break dance or that, you know what I'm saying? And so it's like, that could be real. And then it's like, but they get it. They kind of feel it. And some people even told me, like out here, for instance, they was like, say hip hop and they'll get it. But if you say rap, they think it's something else. And so generally what I would say is rap is one of the art forms of 
and within hip hop, it is probably the most recognizable in the sense of like on the surface level. It's what most people think of as hip hop. When they think of rap, they say, oh, that's a rapper or that's a hip hop artist. But see, I want to talk about the separation between the what it is to rap or be a rapper versus to be in hip hop. Um, you don't necessarily have to be a rapper to be in hip hop. You can, you can, uh, you might not even know how to rap, but you know, you can be a visual artist. Like to me, a graphic designer who designs my flyers, like Michael Jordan Payton, who I told you did the It Ain't Easy video. He's an all around artist. He raps, produces, he does hip hop workshops like these. He works for the president, vice president. He, uh, he does flyers. He's doing the Murder Inc. documentary. Um, and you know, it's a lot of things he does. So to call him just a rapper would be almost kind of like limiting him, but let's not just look at him. It's limiting hip hop. It's limiting his community. It's limiting everything. And Kanye West talks about this a lot. He talks about how he wants to, wanted to be like Walt Disney. He wanted to uh, design shoes. He wanted to run for president. And many people laugh at that. Like for instance, uh, Jennifer Aniston is like made a made a statement. It's not funny. Don't vote for Kanye. And this is a that's a political thing. Anyone can decide and feel how they want about politics. But to tell a man he can't run for president and tell a man he can't create more, but everyone loves him as a rapper. It's kind of like a good a good example of how a lot of times black art forms or black people and concepts in America about what what black people, poor people, and that you can use hip hop as the metaphor, hip hop heads, whatever, the rebels, the people with the other ideas, they're limited. It's like, oh, get this job. And then that's it. Go work for this company. And that's all you can do. Or go to college. And that's all you can do. Or have a family. That's all you can do. Or even like when Obama ran, it's like I did the first hip hop song for Obama that went nationwide. And, you know, a lot of people would say he was the first hip hop president. He, he, he really embraced it. He reached out. But a lot of people hated on him for it. It's like, oh, he's down with hip hop. So he can't be the president. He's not professional. And I've even went through that as an artist. It's like, choose one, be an artist. But then if you try to be a businessman, like I have a record company, Rendezvous Records, that's too much. Or you try to do something positive like Hip Hop Congress, it's like, well, you're just trying to sell records. And this is important because we have to look at the two sides of hip hop. There's, and that's not even, it's two sides of everything. Just because you're a, you're making music or a dancer or a visual artist does not mean it's all about the money. And it, some people are all about the money, and it, but a sales transaction is not necessarily hip hop. A sales transaction is a corporate cap capitalism concept. You're selling a CD. You're selling your, your, maybe you're selling your talent. And that is a part of hip hop. But a lot of times we get confused because we forget an artist is still inspired. They're still inspired by their own inspirations. Like I, I spoke at Stanford uh, maybe a year or so ago. A good friend of mine, her name is Ashley. We call her Ashley L. She's from Michigan, I believe, uh, either Flint or Pontiac. She came out to the Hip Hop Congress National Conference in Detroit. I was out there with Shimako, who was the former president, one of the founders. Shout out Shimako. He's one of the people who taught me and helped me refine a lot of these things I'm talking about. And I think he was probably the first person I looked at as a personal friend and, and saw as a, as a sociologist in my head when I moved to San Jose. But the idea is I met Ashley uh, through uh, another friend who did hip hop debate. Uh, her name's Jen. She's from Seattle. She did a program called Hip Hop Debate, getting hip hop into the uh, kind of closed off circuit of debate, which is usually a, a sector that kind of leads into politics, you know, debate. Hip hop, hip hop battles. See how those connect? You gotta go through both. You gotta study both sides of everything. Just like I said, hip hop, rap. Uh, you know, Kanye running for president versus don't vote for Kanye is a bad. Look at both sides. That's how a hip hop battle was. Back in the days, we battled in the streets. So I don't like what you talking about. So here we go. Boom. Like, you look silly. I'm on you, man, on the hilly. 
man, you look like you about to go pop hella pillies. And then the dude come back and he like, man, you whack. Man, you ain't even from this track. Man, you don't even know what's going down, man. These is facts. That's a battle. You're going back and forth. Sometimes it's more serious, but sometimes it's not. And we're going to talk about, we, I'm jumping around to so many topics, but it's like we're talking about how is the what's beneath the surface. Like the the, the young the young king, uh, King Von just got killed. Boozy just got shot. A lot of people I see online, they're like, uh, you know, rap is killing these kids. And they're doing this because of rap. Cut that out. This is not because of rap. You could say that rap ma rap hypes it up and magnifies it or the media behind rap. Maybe if they're focusing on it in that sense or they're saying those things on the on the on the news, then you could say you got people thinking <laughs> that King Von died because of rap. King Von more so was saved because of rap. He was more so saved from being, every time he rapped and was in the studio and on tour, maybe you get into stuff, but you get into stuff anyway in the hood. If you from, I'm from East Oakland, Chicago, man, I talk, man, even in somewhere like a suburb or anywhere, you can get into it anywhere over anything. You know, I've been to Placerville County, no offense, and I've been called the N-word, I've been threatened, I've been told to leave immediately, you N-word. I mean, and that's, supposedly compared to what I'm used to, it's the suburbs. To to my friends who live there, they're like, nah, that's not that's not a that's not a safe place. And and places like uh and things like what what I've seen with Auburn Hip Hop kind of is a direct cultural thing to combat that and bring a good vibe. So you can get into it anywhere. It ain't just rap. That's like I wouldn't blame, you know, like a rapper from Auburn for the racism in Auburn, especially if their raps are about the opposite. So you got to look at the positive and negative sides of these things. When a rapper is from the streets, you can't say they're wrong for rapping about that. That's their life. You can't say everyone who hears it is going to do that or that or that's their fault. But you can say is, and where I look at it is, it's more about, and this is what how we did it in Hip Hop Congress. And I'm I'm very much like I saw Royster Five Nine. He said. Uh, He's against censorship. I just saw him say that because he was talking about King Von's murder. I want y'all to know King Von and none of these rappers. I grew up in a very violent area, uh, and it's not the rapping that's killing us. It's not the rapping that's – before rap, there was racist killing black people. There was – you know, there's women getting uh, assaulted and things in every community. And so to say rap is the reason or rap is the reason that women twerk or – Rap is the reason kids drop out of school. I've heard that when I try to do organize. It's ridiculous. We're not solving anything. The The real reason for violence often is we have a lot of um, unchecked anger. We have a lot of untapped resources. We have a lot of people that are minimalized and put into these areas. If you, you could go into a lot of history with racism. A lot of uh, hip hop mirrors a lot of the microcosms of race and culture in America and any culture you go to in around the world, including Seoul or Japan or Nigeria, we have, we're have we building chapters in these places, New York, Atlanta. Everything you see is connected to culture. So these things uh, are not just hip hop issues. Like sexism is not it's just a hip hop issue. It's in hip hop. Homophobia is not just a hip hop issue. There's so much. There's lots of love for, for um, LGBTQ and hip hop too. And there's many examples of very clear proof of that. But what happens is when one person comes out and, and says and says a terrible thing, we kind of look at what we want to blame and say, well, man, those rappers, man, I swear in this election, I've been hearing nonstop. Those rappers are ruining it. Those rappers are making folks jump for, vote for Trump. Like Lil Wayne comes out and says he supports Trump, which is his choice. And uh, no, I ain't got nothing bad to say about Wayne. It's, it's his choice. But the, my point is, it's a lot of Wayne fans, and it's a lot of Wayne fans who going to ride with whatever politics he ride with, which I consider that a follower. But that's on them. There's some followers out there. But it's some people who like, man, I like Wayne's raps, but I ain't supporting what he do in politics or his street life or the things he do. It's, it's like you can hear Tech 9 rap about horror movie shit, 
like you would hear when you watch Jason Friday the 13th just passed. I just dropped a, a horror theme song or video uh, from my own artistic perspective. That don't mean I'm going to do it or I'm pushing somebody to go be like Jason Voorhees. A lot of hip hop and life and is about um, how we how we process the information. Life is all about it's, it's you take in the info and then it's, it's how you trans trans translate it. So I think hip hop is good for helping with translation, participating in art, having deep conversations, debate, writing, reading. All of these things to me have been part of the hip hop experience. Um, hip hop and scapegoating is a huge issue. Um, it's okay to criticize. I'm, I'm a hip hop head. I told you I was the most critical. Uh, often on as a youngster, I was so into hip hop to get out of the mind state of the hood I was in. I wanted to escape. Sometimes we want to escape through art and we get so locked in on it, we blame it when it doesn't work, when it doesn't help us escape, when it when it leaves us, when it, when it hurts our feelings because we hear a truth we don't like or a concept we didn't, wasn't ready for. We blame the whole genre or it's just like. It's just like this. I've seen this this video recently of this, this, this white teacher online, you know, the pandemic school stuff. And she was like, they were discussing social history and Black Lives Matter. And uh, she was like, well, if if black people got a right to feel something about racism, I got a right to hate all black people because I got robbed in Atlanta. And I was like, you know what? Um, that's that's a common thing we do in life, not just white people. It's a common thing we, we tend to do. You have to train yourself against this. We, it, You know, they call it stereotypes. It's a difference between uh, stereotypes and um, pure racism. Sometimes we all have prejudices that we we believe. Okay, I saw this. I seen a woman do this, so women do this. Or I seen black people do this, so black people do this. It's, it's something that goes against our growth. And I think it's a process. And I think hip hop can help with that process. And it can, if it, and some, some may reinforce the process, but it's our job for our own well-being in our own circles to learn how to navigate. So whatever comes out, I don't care if it's the worst rapper ever, the most sexist rapper ever, the most racist rapper. There's lots of racist rappers out there. There's KKK rappers. There's, you know, all kind of rappers that say the wrong thing or the, the worst thing. I've said bad things that I, I, I wouldn't want to say again in raps that I've learned from. But the point is, we got to know to 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 reconnect with, with with growth, with growth. It's about growth. Man, we start off as kids, man, as a rapper. I, man, I was worse than all these rappers. I was worse than Tyler, the creator. I was worse than all these these crazy sounding rappers, Eminem. We said whatever. We didn't care because we was young in the hood. We didn't give a damn. We could die the next day. The, I will tell you all this, man. The last thing a, a, per, a poor person or a woman being abused and and uh, and assaulted and uh you know somebody with their life on the line somebody hungry somebody in a third world country the last damn thing on their mind is a rap song's uh, effect you understand me because the real corruptions that's going on the real travesties of slavery holocaust uh what happened to the indigenous the poverty levels the the flint michigan shit it's more rappers that's trying to help that Believe it or not, whatever they rapping about, it's a lot of behind the scenes work going on. And it's just as much apathy and people not doing something. But that's how the, that's how most of the world is. It's like voting or politics. Most people will watch or just vote and not really participate. Or they don't think, man, I got to get on Joe Biden. I got to get on Obama. I got to go to this school. Like, you know those parents? Like, I'm a parent. I got three kids. One of my kids is a rapper, and I got two little girls. They out here now. One of the things is, and this is what I push for. I just dropped a song called Vote Why. I, it's, it's been out for a while. We was doing some project programs with Hip Hop Congress, Van Jones. The reason I, I push, and the reason I make a lot of my songs or whatever is, and the way I see it is, and this is, I fought for this, and I think Hip Hop Congress and a lot of y'all are fighting for this. And we, if some fans fight for this, it's not just about criticizing somebody's art and raps. 
It's also about making things matter, making things useful, using things for more than frivolous things. So a lot of songs and videos I make, uh, people might assume, and this happens a lot, they assume it's for sale and it's for my, my record sales and for me to go fake and brag about my platinums and <laughs> my chain. And you see, I got on beats. I just got this from a temple. Like, but honestly, some stuff is not for that. Like, I, I honestly don't think everyone's doing things just for sales. And that's what I think makes art special because some things in art is hard to fake for sales. Like, I don't really see the benefit of running, of Kanye running for president if it wasn't in his heart. Or, uh, you know, some things are artistic. Like, we, we want to we wanna excuse our favorite artists for this or that or give credit for this to give credit. Some things are in us. Like some, some, like some people said Wayne did this, reported Trump for money. Maybe that's the actual lane he wants. Maybe he likes that. We're not all the same. And I think when we look at our arts favorites, it's like food. We assume everyone thinks like us. And I think that part of hip hop is good. That's been good. Is it's giving voice to a lot of perspectives. <laughs> If you want to learn about an area, they say you can learn. Culture is what we do to learn what uh, customs and uh, traditions of an area. So, like, one of those things could be food or, uh, you know, oral history. They, you know, they call it the griots of Africa. They say, a lot of people say that's hip-hop's origin right there. So, uh, or one of the origins. And that's another thing to talk about. Uh, hip hop and the origins and like where it came from, who started it. Those are all good discussions that that are limited a lot of times. We limit conversations. But the, the bottom line is the last thing on a struggling person's mind is just what a rapper said. Like, you know, for instance, this is a funny story I tell growing up listening to Too Short. He's one of my favorites. And that doesn't mean I agree with everything he says or it's cosign every rap or or uh, I talk like that or not all the time or whatever. But a lot of us grew up with, say, like a too short, but we also grew up with Humpty Hump and Boots Riley. So we embraced and heard a lot of those things, you know. So my point is uh, I would always say that, uh, you know, Too Short has this early song called Don't Fight the Feeling. And he's talking hella shit, and it's, it's just a vulgar song. And he's clowning around. He's probably hella young when he made it. But the beauty of that song is every other verse, it's a girl coming back at him. Like, nah, F you, you ain't this. You can't talk to me like that. I'm a strong woman. Woo, woo. We also take that in. So don't get it twisted. Like, sisters where I come from ain't sitting around waiting for no rapper to diss them. They dissing back. They fighting back. They're coming back maybe their own way. It's women rappers and it's women with their own voice. So it's not always this one way street of the uh, negative smashing on the positive. Sometimes the positive is smashing back. And that's a good part of hip hop. That's a good part of what's inside of us. We can't always, when we look at, uh, when we look at the, the uh, situation of American oppression, there's that, there's the ugly side of that. The, 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 the side we've seen the last four years and, uh, and, and the, the ugly racist, sexist, ridiculous side that makes America look terrible. And that's not just in America. That, that energy's everywhere. But there's the side that's fighting back. That's like, nah, we don't want that. We don't want sexism. We don't want to hate on uh, gay people. We don't want to hate. Uh, we want to have fun. We want to enjoy this. We don't want to kill. We don't want to kill each other over rap. We don't want to, uh, you know, not raise our kids and be, and be lame. We don't want to not learn. Like, that's another part of hip hop. And I'm here to push for that. Uh, hip hop Congress is here to push for that. If we're not also as much as we criticize pushing for that, what are we doing? So here's one of the things that I feel is very much a part of one of the narrative things I like to speak on is involvement. That's what vote vote why was about. It was involvement versus criticism. Like if criticism with no involvement is worthless. Cheering with no involvement. I'm not gonna say it's worthless because words and Opinions do count. They do matter. They do influence. But I mean, if that's the ninety-nine percent of what you're doing versus involvement, you're you're already taking out your own personal power. So being mad off the the president or mayor without saying I can get involved and go tell this person or go do something that's going to change this or or change make a wave of change. 
that's when we own something. So here's something I really was into. Let's not, I, 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 I'm less about criticizing someone's art, which is, we all got opinions. I got things I want to say or feel or things I don't think is cool. Or whatever. But the number one thing I look at is involvement because there's a lot of artists who have what some would call rougher music. And I've come to them to say, hey, you know, I know, I know, you know, we I'm from the streets, you from the streets. We, we got different paths, but hey, check this out. I, I get it. You got fans, people feel you. And I also know a lot of these artists who might not have the prettiest music or art, people, it's people who draw and draw devils and weird stuff. I'm not like a, on some religion stuff, but I'm just saying it's people with dark books and drawings. But those people might be the nicest people when they'll come out and give back and do charity. And blah, blah, blah. I know artists with the toughest music. And I say, hey, like the Jacka, I'll be like, hey, come out. Let's do let's go talk to this, 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 uh, these kids in the hood. I'm there. He's there all night. No money. No nothing. He's there all night on the block where the gunshots going off, talking to these kids, the ones that's really going to do the shootings, the ones that's going to do the, the dirt. He telling them, hey, I done that. Don't do it. And I've been in jails and juvenile halls speaking this same stuff I'm speaking on this on this um, this video. So I ain't just saying it in quiet and private amongst all the smart rappers and all the uh, the college kids and all the cats that's paying me. I'm saying this same stuff. I've been saying this on panels in Stanford. I told uh, in Stanford. I, I I got. I told you Ashley L. Uh, she came to a conference in Detroit and. She came to some of our programs. I remember when we introduced her to Rosa Clemente, my homegirl. I, I I did the doors open, man, to tell me when to go. I did the doors open, tell me when to go with Rosa Clemente. And she ran for, uh, she was vice presidential nominee for the Green Party. Shout out to the Green Party. Nothing against, they, I got dumb love for them. But, because they got love for hip hop. And we got involvement with them. They, they reached out before Obama was doing the hip hop and Joe Biden, the hip hop outreach. Green Party and a lot of them was doing it more. Just let's not get it twisted. So, uh, but so it's all about narratives. We we all talk about the red and blue. But anyway, check this out. Ashley L. She uh she came to the workshop and she ended up becoming a professor and having all these degrees. She moved to the Bay and, and she ended up teaching at Stanford. And she called me up. She said, "I want you to come speak. I'm doing a, a, a class on, on creative writing, but it's like college students that's gonna maybe be teachers or whatever." I came and spoke and they asked me, uh, you know, the, you know, you know, the Bay righteousness and uh, hippies and wokeness. And, you know, I love it. I grew up in it, you know, but, uh, you know, it's evolutions to it. Like, I, I get it. Sometimes you got to go into the underworld to be the wokest as you can be. Sometimes you got to deal with those tough, those King Vons and those tough ones that's got the gun at the aimed at them to really help the poorest, the ones in the tents and camps. That's real hip hop activism. And I'll tell you this, and I told them Stanford students that were great students. I love them to death. They show much love, but they, they had the same thing I see in a lot of people. It was like, well, let's talk about the, and I, appear, I appreciate that. It was like, let's talk about the Kendrick Lamar uh, All Right song and Immortal Technique, my homie Immortal Technique, man, my guy. I love that guy. But, uh, and I know all about it. And I knew him before a lot of y'all. Like we, we, man, I've been in brawls where we brawled side by side with gangsters, like, and, and protected women together. Like I've been to Harlem where our niggas ran up on me. Like, where are you from? Like, I'm like Oakland. And they like, Hey man, you know where you at? And I'm like, man, I know immortal technique. And they like, Oh shit, well you good. Like, so these things are real. These things are real. And you know, that same guy told me a story that immortal technique used to drag dudes out their car for stalking women and fucking throw them out the hood. That's hip hop activism I know. Hip hop activism I know was asking my neighbor for a dollar so me and my mom could eat. It was taking, believe this or not, taking old thrown away pizzas from round table and East my mom out the garbage. Me and my mom ate out the garbage, nigga, and passed it around to the other people in the apartments. I used to knock on people's door for 50 cents. Like, that's hip hop activism to me. So all this other stuff and, and who got the award and the panel, that's it is what it is. I love it, but it starts way before that, and that's what I told. And they these Stanford students put that on their books. They put this on the Stanford uh, the Stanford uh, archives. I said, look, we could talk about Kendrick and Mortal all day, but if you don't know these stories about tech dragging folks out the hood for rape, trying to rape girls, 
You don't get it. If you don't understand that the story of Good Kid Mad City and the story he's telling of growing up in the hood in a terrible gangbanging place, he probably even had to move around with gangbangers. He family, it's different. You can't just be woke by yourself. So hip hop activism and social justice, it starts way before hip hop. It starts way before you ever hear, heard of our music. It starts way before we start acting woke and wake up and figure out uh, to how to be positive. Some of us are on a journey to figure out how to be positive. Uh, well, my, my idol is not a rapper. It's actually was Malcolm X. And uh, one of the, the reasons I love him so much is because one, he spoke, he spoke and broke things down. That's what I love about hip hop. Break things down. Even if you rap, even when you freestyle, you might mess up. Me and Ryan and Jamal just did a workshop. And we was talking about when you mess up, you got to keep going and play it off or change your rhythm. But like, you can be wrong and fix it. You can fix it. You can come back and do it better. But this idea of you are this way and you're locked in this way, that's the limits that hip hop won't allow. That's the limits that activism won't allow because we're always saying make it better. That's the actual dream of what a, what a government or what America's supposed to be. We're supposed to get better and better and better. The question is how fast, how long? Well, hip hop's been around, some would say, since the 70s. Early said the early, the, the, the accepted answer for a real hip hop head would be the early 70s in the Bronx is the beginning, right? Of the real kind of what you see today. And now you've evolved from graffiti, the four elements. That's another discussion. I love it. I love it. And I, and then generally, when you're talking to a rapper who you might consider a youngster from today, who just only knows like, uh, uh, you know, the the the, uh, the drill music and the trap music, you might say you might bring it up. Oh, the four elements. And I've heard it all my life. You know, I, I'm from I'm well educated in that. But because I grew up on New York rap too, but. There's histories of hip hop in other areas. It's not only New York. And KRS One told me himself. And from what I'm hearing, my, my OG from Fillmore, one of the dance legends of hip hop, not not break dancing. See, that's another thing. He has this workshop called the, the Hip Hop: The Story of Hip Hop Before Hip Hop, where he does um, hip hop, but he's talking about dance, hip hop dance before it was before it was just known as break dancing in New York. There was like Boogaloo and uh, and Robot and, and stuff like that strutting in the West Coast, in, in the Bay Area in particular. And so when the hip hop went big, you know, Break In and all those movies came out, a lot of that history got seen as just that area. So sometimes the, the media and the way something comes out makes it, you know, leave some history out. It's, it's, it, can, it has to happen. It's not, it's impossible. No one can know all history of all everything. But um, the Bay has a lot of history, and you can find the starting point of a lot of hip hop movements in different regions. Not just New York's history is important, although nationally and, and internationally, you got stuff like Zulu Nation, who I believe was the first huge international movement that went overseas and took hip hop overseas. But then I got uh, my homie from New from uh, Africa. He's doing. He's gonna be the HHC Africa rap for night. I'm sorry. Africa's a continent, a huge, massive, the biggest continent, not just a country. But he's from Nigeria, which is one of the more popular countries and a huge music art hub. I mean, oh, my gosh. And so, uh, you know, what they're going through right now with NSARS and in uh, SWAT, they're, they're going through this police brutality. But it's worse. They're getting straight murdered. It's shot up by, by black people, by their own government corruption. It don't stop in just America, but it's different kinds. There's, there's like me and him debate all the time because he's like, from us, we getting killed a lot of times by, it's like color people getting killed or poor people getting killed by uh, like uppity or, or maybe racist white cops or I'm not saying all, but like, that's what you're seeing a lot. The George Floyd type shit is, it's nobody's shocked when it's a black man from the hood with his knee on his neck from a white uppity weird suck ass cop. But then and, and, and me and him debate, because in Africa, he's saying it's our own. And that's what it kind of feels like a lot of times in the hood. What we do is we, we, we're we in a poor closing area. A lot of that is due to racism. And one of the things I talk about in my workshop, I'm doing it a little less formal here. 
But I like to talk about in America, a lot of people don't understand geography of America first and also the regions of America. One thing in hip hop Congress, we had to make a regional map for hip hop and then decide, well, what do we call this area? And we did it through the hip hop eyes. Like it's different than how they map it off. And if you get a chance, y'all check out this thing. Uh, it's called the 11 regions of America or something like that. And it breaks down the regions in a deeper way outside of um, just how we see the state's lines. And even when you see the red and blue map, there's a whole history of how America's broken down into these regions. And you can do that for a lot of things. Like you can do that for religion. You can do that for male, female, racial breakdowns, but you can also do it for hip hop. So we try to look at it like, like for instance, when they say, uh, we say East Coast, West Coast. When you look at that, it's very limiting. Because when people say East Coast in hip hop, most of the time they're mostly 95% talking about New York, New York City, not even New York State. So even a Syracuse motherfucker or a person from upstate New York, or they even feel left out of that, of, of what East Coast means. And then of course you got your Philly and then you got your, and I'm talking about geography of hip hop. You got your Philly, which has a huge legacy. You got your New Jersey. But a lot of when I was growing up, we, we kind of clumped a lot of New Jersey and Philly in with New York because a lot of them were on New York labels. But then there's a point where you start had to see, oh, Philly's Philly. And Philly will tell you we're Philly like we got our own. But a lot of times there's a starting point for that or a, a tangible point. Just like for me, my starting point with knowing the Auburn region as hip hop was when I helped helped build up the Sacramento chapter of Hip Hop Congress, my family, my mom's side, um, a long crazy story, but um, I, I I have I kind of grew up partly in Sacramento because my mom's side moved out there when we was young for some crazy some some crazy gangster shit my auntie did. But uh, shout out my cousin Big Man, he actually was my Sacramento uh, liaison, and then we start I start I used to come out there with him even before I was really popping with rap and and really. Like not even really doing hip, I wasn't even really in hip hop Congress yet. But then the spinoff was the Auburn hip hop tra- chapter, which kind of I met them through the Sacramento chapter. And then it's like, oh, Auburn has hip hop. It was like, whoa. So man, that was what I, I, I can't talk to Rocky right now, maybe through text. But that was what ten maybe plus years ago. It's been a while and it's still going. So a lot of people might have their introduction to that area and their whole cultural view of that area has changed since that has been placed. So it's like you got your national macro view. Well, he said, I'm going on 12. Can you talk to me what that means? You saying I'm over? I'm going over. Should I stop? Um, so you got your national macro and international views, and then you got your regional views of things and their starting points. And this is the point I brought up my boy from Nigeria. We got a song together called Prayer. If you go check out my websites, uh, if you want to check out some of my music um, or check out what I mean by some. Oh, 12 years. Auburn Hip Hop Congress, 12 years. That's beautiful. I mean, it, Man, the time has flown, but it's like so much has been happening. So much has been done. I mean, personally, they helped introduce me to the area, and that helped me introduce more people to the area. But, like, for instance, I brought Busy B, the first, one of the first rappers ever. I was on the Bronx Legends tour, and I brought him through, and that was a deal I made, I think, with between either Rocky and the Hip Hop Congress or Kurt Kane. Um, it was a little mix, or maybe I think I maybe met I, I met Kurt Kane, who's also from that region. That's my boy. Shout out King Kurt, huge transformation. I love that guy. I had a song with him and Percy. I brought Percy P through there, and I brought a lot of artists through there to because uh, I loved it so much. I love the area. So um, my point is, when we talk about geography of hip hop and migrations, you can look at things like, for instance. I'm from Oakland and in Sacramento was like a, like it's its own thing. And you really seeing that even more now with Mozzie, Lavish D, but you always, they always had their own thing. Sometimes we would call SAC and above in that area, we would call it NorCal. And then we still call from uh, maybe, uh, I would guess you would maybe say even from Santa, I guess Santa Cruz would be called Central Valley. 
but then it's still kind of connected on to the Bay a little bit. Then you got San Jose, the South Bay. I got more familiar with Santa Cruz hip hop scene when I lived in San Jose for like eight to 10 years. That's where I helped evolve uh, Rendezvous Records, my record company. And so all these things are good examples of sociology. For instance, um, you know, some people will argue is San Jose the Bay is these, it's like everyone wants to make these maps. And then some people say the Bay is just, you know, the core area around the water. So you got Oakland, the East Bay, and then you got, we don't call San Francisco the West Bay, but you got the West Bay. Then you got the peninsula that's going towards the airport that leads to San Jose. Shout out Raman Jamal, Hip Hop Congress ED. We go way back. He's also part of the Rendezvous Records group. <clears throat> He's a great, great resource uh, for, 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 for hip hop workshops. Man, one of the best rappers. And um, he has the peninsula. And the peninsula, they introduced me to that area, East, East Palo Alto. And then I spoke at Stanford and I told all them fools, I said, man, y'all want to talk about Kendrick and uh, all these other rappers. What about this area in Stanford area? Palo Alto is one of the richest areas in the world, in the Americas for, for sure. And uh, you got a hood right next door where all the rap come from, East Palo Alto, East, East Menlo. And that's where the most famous rappers from that region come from and who who, get, who gathered the respect for that peninsula area. They're all from the hood. And is that a shock to anyone? Like the struggle, you know, hip hop, a lot of it was born out the struggles and where, like I said early, where people didn't have these things. So uh, anyway, the uh, I told them, y'all need to look up these local artists from the 650, it's called 650 Area Code, East Palo Alto. That place has been totally gentrified by uh, Facebook and by tech companies. Now we're in the area era of tech. We're in a new era of hip hop where with tech and you know a lot of automated stuff, and it's it's really affecting how we look at art because a lot of things are automated. It's less from the ground up. It's a lot of uh, digital communication. A lot of stuff that artists used to do is you can do through through apps and stuff. Like even you can make a flyer with the app help. You might you know so artists a lot of what artists do is getting lost in translation. Like we got the auto tunes and all that. Back to Africa and Bishop, the artist that I was talking about. And if, like I said, if you want to check out some of these examples and videos, go to dlabri.com. Uh, check out uh, my YouTube, D-L-A-B-R-I-3. And then check out uh, hiphopcongress.com, auburnhiphopcongress.com. All these are good resources you can check out. Oh, also I got a Bandcamp, dlabri.bandcamp.com. New sampler. If y'all need some of these, holler at me. I got video. You can see all that. But... Bishop had a, we had a debate. He's from Nigeria. He's a rapper. He's got some really good stuff. We did a song called Prayer Reloaded. We shot the video in Tokyo. And it's, it's kind of prophetic about what just happened in Nigeria recently. This, this, in Nigeria, this whole situation y'all saw on TV where all these people was killed. I showed my daughters that and they reacted like crazy. My daughter was like crying. She was like, I don't want this for the, for the world. She was like, I don't want to see this. I don't want this to happen to me. My only daughter, my daughter is six years old. My other daughter is like in the gore and fighting. And we call her Beast Code. She got my Oakland side. She was like, oh, he's dead, daddy. Like, ugh. Like she had an idea, a thing of like, man, I want to see it. I want to be, I'm going to be there. And, and and she might be the one who knows, be military or MMA fighter or, a, you know, an athlete or who knows, who knows. Either way, our kids going to be dealing with this stuff. You know what I'm saying? So my point here is uh, Bishop would say, you know, uh, we, he said, American blacks complaining about the the ghetto is funny to us. He was like, it's like telling a man that with bad shoes, like telling a man with no shoes about how your shoes got holes. And I was like, whoa. And he was like, man, we would love to have y'all presidents and government people because the corruption here, he said, y'all get killed once in a while or y'all get put in jail. But he said, here, they'll kill us in mass. And he said, here, they'll just take all our money and all our government taxes. And he said, they'll just take, and he said, you can send $10 billion here and, <laughs> and aid and we could reach out and they'll take it all and won't give, won't give a dime to the poor. And he was like, so the gap between rich and poor or middle class and basically on your deathbed is just so much crazier. So even that I was telling Rocky last night, I was saying, uh, you know, I wanted to make this this workshop available 
to the world and the people I know in uh, in Asia and, and, and Africa, Europe, and people who don't speak English, people in, uh, you know, Middle East, all of that, because the reason why is because I was telling them people here, people outside of America don't take hip hop for granted as much. Um, what Bishop got through to me, and it was funny because I'm all about the black power in Africa, and man, I'm all about the international, man. I love it. And I, I really, you know, like to go to the to the to the areas that that, that are challenging, you know, and that's partly because I want to have more gratitude. I want to have more uh, perspective. And I, my whole perspective changed as a rapper. It all changed when I came overseas. And uh, and I actually put my first album out in Japan, which was an accident. I didn't have no clue that would happen, but it actually changed my whole path as an artist. And actually, it, I kind of traded some of what I would have maybe got as a local celeb for being a traveler, a tour, which is sometimes harder. It's, it's like... It's like when you go out um, and leave the comforts of your your country and kingdom, and you go out to sail the oceans and discover new lands. Not 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 on some Columbus shit, but just on some some journeyman shit. You know what I'm saying? Like it's like uh, I was the type I want to go where it's uncomfortable. Like send me to New York in the freezing cold. I'm a hip hop survivalist, but that's because I was already a survivor in East Oakland. Like I survived a lot, so. I'm like, man, that's enough. I don't need to sit around in, in East Oakland in the hood and, and be in the mix of shootouts and and, and uh, trying to be the king of Oakland. I was like, man, send me to New York in the freezing cold with some Timberlands and a puff coat and some CDs and, uh, and some flyers. And uh, matter of fact, don't even give me the flyers and CDs. I'll get those when I get there. Or send me to Japan with a translator, uh, a good a good business partner, and, a, and, fit, and 5,000 albums. And and uh, and 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 a couple, uh, you know, a couple hundred dollars in yen, and let's go do it. Let's go form a network. So people be like, "Why are you here? Why are you in these places?" I'm doing the same thing I do anywhere else. Same thing I do in the Bay. Same thing I do in Nevada City. Same thing I do in Chicago. I'm trying to uh, create unity. I'm trying to create peace. So another thing about expanding, like I, I use my self example, Mr. Network is not was a theme of my manager telling me that I was, I knew everybody and I got along with everybody. And I, a lot of times that was like the thing that became my alter ego, like this comic book character, my superhero character was Mr. Network. That's, that's my biggest album. You can go check that out. Um, part two is coming soon. I got a few singles out. If you want to get some of my music, even if y'all DJs or uh, if you if you can't afford to buy it, get go to my SoundCloud. I give a lot of free music away on SoundCloud slash D Labrie. That's another one. That's for the real supporters. Go ahead and grab that. If you want to buy something, go ahead. But that ain't the main thing. But the point is, um, I went out there and uh where was I? Where was I? Um oh yeah, I'm like throw me in the throw me in the in the wolf pit. Throw me in the lion's den. Because the point is uh Mr. Network grew. It grew from just this thing where people would be like, oh he got a song with this person or he toured with this person. He's a, he's Mr. Network. He knows people or he uh, he has the connections. And like I never thought of it like that because I grew up around stars and I grew up seeing Mark Curry, Mr. Cooper. I grew up seeing the athletes and Delta Funky Homo Sapiens and the Two Shores and hammer riding by and luxury cars. And, you know, I remember one time I was just chilling at the, at the with my girl at the uh, at Fridays watching the Warriors game and Humpty Hump pulls up, sits next to me like, hey, what's up, D? Like I, I grew up around that, like Linnells and, the, you know, hanging out with the mayor and like, you know, I'll be in Oakland and the mayor just grabbed my daughter out of my hand. Like, hey, what's up, D? Like, that's how we grew up. Ain't no celebrity culture in Oakland like that. Ain't nobody running around for autographs and things of that nature. We, we are real down to earth. Actually, celebrities come to Oakland to hang at the Bay to come out and hang out. As long as you ain't foolish and just going where you ain't supposed to go and starting trouble. You know, uh, you know, you good, but like a lot of celebrities come to the bay to to kick back, to to hang around activists, to learn something, to do workshops. It's, it's really a, a kind of unique area, NorCal in general. But anyway, uh, we we talking uh, we talking geographies, areas, um, cultures of areas. You know, so I'm just kind of talking about how the culture of of Oakland, the Bay Area, Northern California. There's cultures that shape the hip hop sound. So part of like, for instance, like uh, the Chicago thing, 
you got extreme gang activity. That's the, that's actually the gang capital, not L.A. So that's why you can get mad. And I always tell people, I tell my daughters this, the W-H-Y, why will always set you free. You can be mad or upset about something. But if you if you ask why and really want to know the answer, you can have understanding and learn something as opposed to complaining or being mad. <clears throat> um, I uh, think a lot of people look at sh they, a lot of a lot of people who are ignorant or maybe just misled by media. Some people aren't lying to you or wrong or assholes. They're actually misled and they're spreading wrong info or it's limited info. And I'm really against that. But instead of being mad at people for not knowing, which I used to be when in my 15 year old, 16 year old days, my 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 real egotistical uh, days, and my, my I told you my back, I call it backpack elitist days. As that, that's a term I'll get to terms if if I got time. But uh, I would have been like the first to be like, y'all don't know what y'all talking about, and this and that. But for instance, Chicago, a lot of people bring that up when we talk about racism, police brutality, or when you know, black people and rappers or whoever, or even even our allies, they get to repping and say, man, this racist stuff is bad. And we we sick of that. And it's all, man, we need to cut that out and we need to unite. Like, I love it. I love it. That's a beauty, beautiful part of America, too. There's 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 a lot of beauty in the fact that it used to be like black men, like our elders walking down the street, getting kicked and punched by white people. And we couldn't do nothing. But now it's like we got white people marching and like, you know what I'm saying? I got white homies who will, who will pull the strap first. they be like, man, ain't no racism going down around my homie. Like, that's beautiful. That's a beautiful thing. I don't really, that's more beautiful than being mad at the ancestors of theirs that, that was faulty. Like, if they're correcting it, then we on the right track. That's all I'm saying. So uh, my point of that was... Um, about the Chicago, right? A lot of people, their first thing when we talk about issues, and this comes from a lot of us in the hood, and I've had to tell my friends from the hood, we got to chill sometimes, because the thing is, we come from the bottom. We come from the worst, poorest, not the worst people, but the poorest and the worst conditions. Like my homie from Nigeria, he was saying the conditions have us in these bad situations. So it's two different things. You got greed and oppression and uh, you got certain areas where the rich and powerful are just smashing down. But then you got areas where everybody's at the bottom just surviving. And that's different kind of violence. That's different kind of crime. And uh, it's, if you would give the people, give these people resources, give these people uh, opportunities and treat them fairly, then you have, if you squish a bunch of black people in the bottom and redline us, redlining is when they wouldn't let blacks get property. A lot of y'all don't know, a lot of y'all do, that redlining was a was law where they would cut black areas off. And <laughs> there's this thing that was called white flight, where whenever black people moved in, my grandmother went through this, my grandfather went through this, he's a war vet, went through this in Oakland, in East Oakland. My grandfather was called the N-word and all that. By, by by middle class whites who didn't want blacks moving in. Well, he did it anyway. And uh, well, I, what happens is, and as you see now, this is how you get black hoods. All the, the middle class whites moved. The minute a couple black families like my grandfather, my grandfather, not great grandfather, my grandfather died in like 97. My grandma died, Grandma Labrie died two years ago. So racism and all this stuff ain't, oh, it ain't, 400 years ago. It's been going on for 400 years. And you got to keep that in mind when you look at hip hop and see a situation like Chicago. There's 400 years in the making. So a couple of you thinking a few deaths now or a hundred here and there, but it was whole slave ships that died. So like and this whole indigenous community wiped out and pushed into camps. I mean, <laughs> camps. Uh, what, do they, what do they call them? Uh, maybe Rocky can tell me what they call uh, indigenous areas now. But I said camps, and I, I'm going to leave it at that because maybe that's how I feel when you push them off into in their own land and push them off and say, here's your little area. That's like what happened with Palestine. But uh, anyway, my point of saying that was when you look, you got to look at the origins of things reservations see how that sound it don't even sound right when you know these people walk this whole earth 
like walked this whole area and, and, and had their whole little areas. But then you got a media kind of calling them savages. And then you got teams called the Redskins. And like, there's a lot of cultural and there's a lot of indigenous MCs and DJs. And they helped spread that message. Like shout out to my homie, DJ Free Leonard. He named himself DJ Free Leonard. His uncle was Leonard Peltier, who was a, a Native American revolutionary, like Nat Turner or like uh, Harriet Tubman. They fought back. Like these ideas of like these idiotic statements, like slaves were slaves on purpose, or they liked it, or it was okay. It wasn't. We're hearing that from a lot of politicians, and I ain't saying no names, but you know the the the, the regime that just got defeated. A lot of them was talking like that, and in in a government. But then it's, it's sad that we would take that. And then we would actually skip past that and then, and then the genocides we've seen and actually had a nerve to start off with our criticisms of rappers. Like if that's your first criticism, we already wrong. That's why when we start talking about um, Chicago, like you, that's why I keep bringing up Chicago because these people, and I've been to Chicago, I've cleaned up schools in Chicago. I've taught at schools in Chicago. I've rapped with Chicago rappers. I've been to those hoods where people, those hoods are just like East Oakland's and the South Central LA's and the Bronx. And I mean, we don't have to compare. That's something for kids to do. Who's, who's hoods harder and all that? Kids do that. But my point is people are dying and poor. The, 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 the common denominator is poverty, which is the first, the reason why the violence even gets to that point. That's why hip hop's a good thing sometimes when some of these kids can go and leave and go make money and go give opportunities. They save more lives than they hurt. The gang banging and the poverty is where the deaths are coming from. The, the back, I like to use the word backstory a lot. Backstory, um, the term backstory, the term, uh, you know, what's beneath the surface of hip hop is where the deaths and the drama's at. It's not in just the rap side of it or the, the music side of it. It's actually underneath. Like 50 Cent had this statement. He said, being a rapper was easy. He's like, being a gangster was hard. His life was hard. Rapping. So you see 50 now and say, oh, he's such a bad guy. I mean, the man was shot nine times. He grew up with, you know, in a terrible situation that many can't really fathom. And uh, not to make excuses, but we got a lot of things like that in life. Chicago's a really rough area. I tell people straight up, if I'm talking about police brutality, <clears throat> the first thing come out somebody's mouth, well, what about Chicago? I take that as, as, as ignorant because, first of all, one thing that's funny is a lot of racists and people who don't like, and we can apply this to other things too, but I'll just talk about racism for a minute. A lot of people who, talk, who uh, are racist, they don't even live around the people they don't like. Like they, <laughs> they don't, a lot of the most racist white people live nowhere near any black, they live nowhere near Chicago. Like the most non-racist, uh, the most, the least racism comes in places where it's mixed groups of people. So like you go to those areas, you won't catch super racism like that in Southside Chicago where the murders are actually happening. You also, what you won't see is anyone helping you won't see any support from a racist or a sexist or, or somebody homophobic. They're not helping those communities. So my thing is, if you're not helping, then shut up. You know what I'm saying? Shut up. Like, if you're not helping, at least be quiet. You know, that's how I look at it. You know what I'm saying? But that's just a funny thing that a dude, you know, a, 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 oh, okay, okay. Okay, we got somebody, pinky, pinky Ring, doing a workshop. Shout out to her. Hip hop U.S. ambassador out of Chicago. There we go. Hey, I got all love for Chicago because I grew up in hoods like that, and I'm no in no way excusing the violence. And that's our job. Like a lot of us, our job is to speak, and it's a lot of good things these these hood rappers are doing too. It's just that when you're in the fire in the line of fire, and you're coming out of these dangerous situations. You know, we look at it like it's a choice. Sometimes it's a something you're trying to escape, but you can't. And you getting pulled back in. And so uh, we I think a lot of times we need sympathy and empathy also for for especially our younger artists and our younger people. Uh, I tell a lot of OG artists, you know, criticizing these young artists. If you're going to do it, do it with love, do it with mentorship, do it with opportunities. 
doing it just to be, oh, these rappers don't know what they're talking about. We didn't either. We talked, our old raps was not Peachy King, Queen, Peachy King, and our, we wasn't all singing uh, Sesame Street. We was in the streets. A lot of us had problems and did things wrong and made lots of youthful mistakes. So I'm into mentorship. I'm into offering opportunities and involvement because that's what saved me. Criticism's fine if it's done constructively. But what I hear is a lot of, man, these rappers and this, even as a rapper, and then let's just, and that's, and that's another thing I want to talk about, the art form versus the, the business side. I hear a lot of business talk that is annoying. It's just like, who's hot? Who has the hot? Who has the views? Who uh, Who's popping? Who? Who's, who's, who's broke and man, that's corny, man. I'm about the art, man. Like let's let, we can talk about who's successful and talk about successful ideas, but like, it's one thing to be like, when I say I'm about the art, I don't mean, I think the maturity for me is if you are an artist and you're choosing say to leave a gang to, to focus on rap, I'm not going to just make it about criticizing your rap just to do it. Like, if you may be not to me the most skilled, I'm still feel there's a value in mentoring or maybe like looking at the value of your career or your opportunities beyond if the song's good or like, you know, like sometimes just like, sometimes just playing basketball, just going to college is good, is good, is a good step. It's not, you don't have to have straight A's to go to college and learn something. Now my son just had some issues in college and I say, yo, you don't have to you don't have to make it feel you don't feel bad because you didn't get the degree right away. Like you don't have to apologize for that. You the, the apologize to yourself if you didn't learn nothing, if you didn't grow from it. And that's what some of these things we got to look at. We can when we get into the sport like basketball, man, you you competitive. You like, man, your game sucks. But I always tell my daughters I got two when they're close in age. I say compete to get better, but make each other better. Like if you gonna like, I teach them. I teach them like, like if y'all gonna fight, then fight fair and do some martial arts together. Like, don't fight over a toy or like do a sneak move where you punch a sister in the back of the head over, you know, some because you jealous. I said go fight straight up and then make each other better fighters and then you go fight the world together. That's how it's supposed to be. Like, there's nothing wrong with hip hop competition. Like, even uh, you hear some rappers say. Like early songs of friends rapping, like Biggie and the Locks, or uh, Pac and Money B. My homie Money B said, uh, he said him and Pac used to talk about who had the better verse. And he said, uh, Pac would sometimes Pac would be like, "You got me, you 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 outrapped me." And so you know we got those debates. It's fun, but some people get too into it, and we lose a lot of energy when it goes too far. We waste a lot of time. Uh, one thing that was dope about Pac at the end of the day. <clears throat> We're trying to do art, but like we need opportunities. And that, and that Ice Cube was saying that also about uh, the contract with Black America. Some people didn't like it because he because uh, he met with some Trump staffers or whatever. But his ultimate point he was saying was, you know, we need opportunities. We need people that can help us get opportunities. And if you just rapping just for sport and you're hating on people who are trying to make a living or or who are trying to grow. And maybe they're not the best dancer yet. They're not the best rapper yet. They're not the most positive yet. But they're trying, and they're trying to learn the art. When you push them away and laugh at them and say, oh, you're just a gangbanger, or you just was an ex-stripper. I mean, like, there's two different sides to that. There's there's the artistic side where you might, you might have a real criticism on the art, or you don't have to like every artist. Like, I'm not a fan of every rap or every rapper. But there's a, another side to supporting each other and to being uh, activists or to being educators. It's like a teacher. You come into class, you got 10 students. you like, man, I really like this one more. This one's gonna go on to be president. This one probably go on to be, you know, engineer or this one might be. And then you got that one to act up. Your job as a teacher is still to support that person and make them better, not worse. If you just say, oh, you suck, get out of my school and you just going to jail. And you're, you're prof prophesizing that. But if you say, hey, man, look, look, you, you, you wildin', but look, like, I think you might be good at this. Come over here and uh, let, let me show you something. Let me inspire you somehow. Let me, let me help or leave you alone. 
Like, leave you alone or help or leave you alone. Like, that's how I see it. I ain't going to criticize a rapper unless I'm just in my sport mode or unless it's like a battle where we challenging each other for sport. I'm not out here to just because I consider myself a very talented artist and I, I actually feel I've done some good things. But the point of that and this part of goes back to the view of the bigger picture, Mr. Network and all and how I grew was tepping, stepping out of my own ego to say, I need to do more. I need to do better. I need to work better with people. I need to support people more and not make it about my skills and if, if and my success to make, like a lot of people, and this is one criticism I think is a good way. And I don't, I don't like this part of hip hop either. The me aspect of like, it's all about me. I done this, I done that. Sometimes that goes too far. And we go, some people lock too far into that, uh, that dynamic and that's another reason we have a lot of faking and fronting and, and that does play into some of the murders and the, the fights and people and a lot of fans push this and media we all play a role in that like you you know big von dies you got people on there oh who, yeah he he was lacking he didn't have his gun or he didn't man he these dudes ain't really gangsters i hear debates was, was tupac a gangster or not that's not the point that's not the point like if 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 you're if you're a, it's like man, Pac is uh died at 24. The point is don't die at 24. If you ain't learned that from Pac, you ain't learned shit. Like the point is Pac left seven albums of wisdom, and some of it you don't got. It's not with some of it is is ignorant. But if you can't learn from it, fine, leave it alone. But if I would rather you debate and just dis discuss his lyrics in an intel intellectual way or find some inspiration or don't listen to him or or promote somebody better. But if your debate is still hip hop versus rap or this guy's a, this guy's a rapper, this guy's an MC, he sucks because he's not an MC. That's cool amongst us. That's like basketball. They're going to have these little petty debates. So, oh yeah, who had better handles? Iverson or Curry? That's all fun in the art world. But when we getting real, like if Pac was a gangster or not and trying to critique this and make make a silly discussion about, you know, who was in what gang or who was lacking with the gun or, you know, who, you know, who had sex with who, like all that get, it get to a petty level where it's like, who cares, who cares how many sex partners this rapper had or, uh, if this, if this, what this woman did before, like, that's like you getting into gossip and who, and you're, you're like, it's really, what's your real opinion? Like, what's your real point? Like, if you're saying it to teach me something, like, I sometimes use examples to just explain how we're all human and how the backstory matters. But when it's just to just be hating, you got to shake haters, man. Like, you got to shake haters, like, in general, not just in rap. That's one thing as a rapper. You know, I, I I always say take criticism and take uh take take criticism and praise with a grain of salt sometimes and use it or just don't get too wrapped up in it like ego wise because we all have different views we all have different opinions some people will tell you something about you that ain't even true some people will tell you stuff about rap or about a history event or tell you something and tell you in the wrong the wrong information. And like, they think it's right, but it's like, you can't, you know, if somebody walk up and say, love, love is, love is not real. It's, man, you should never fall in love. Huh? Like, I always tell people, don't ask if the movie good, go see it. Don't ask if the book is good, read it. Like you can ask, but if I say, no, nah, I didn't like it. Don't not read it. Cause I said that, <laughs> you feel me? Don't, don't not like, uh, you know, this rapper because I don't like him or because, you you know, don't not vote because your favorite rapper said not vote. You know what I'm saying? Learn from your favorite rapper or keep or out or actually teach your favorite rapper or do something like you don't have to wait for people like to, to, to fix. Like, I think one thing that's great about hip hop is we can be we can we can value heroes, but it's a, being an artist. You can kind of find your own inner hero. Uh, I, I don't want to go forever unless, unless you know, I don't know if there's any questions or people still tuned in. Um, but it's, uh, a couple of last points um, about hip hop is area, regionalism. It'll teach you a lot. Like I said, the Chicago, you want to know why people are doing this or that. 
a good way to look is look at their culture, look at their religion, look at their, not religion, look at their culture and region and the history of that region. That can be family, that can be the outer circle community, that can be the city, state, country. There's cultural um, connections to all of these things. Um, the Great Migration, uh, one thing that's really important to know about America is um, how, like I said, that 11 regional thing will help you understand the history of these areas, Northeast, the uh, West Coast versus the middle, and why these areas and beyond red and blue are these ways. It's because of the way they were settled and the way the people and the cultures who came there. Some places were uh, colonized by Spain. That's why you would have people who's more Spanish speakers here, more Catholics here, and you got people coming from France, running places here. You got your upper colonies in the Northeast that came from England, and you got certain accents from there. You got the East Coast with your different types of islands, different types of what we call black people, different types of Latins, different types of relationships between uh, this island to this state. So like, for instance, in, in, uh, in the East Coast, you got more Africans, more different types of Africans, more different types of uh, Islanders, more different, like you got Cubans, you got uh, Puerto Ricans. Like if you, a Puerto Rican's view on being Latin, Spanish, or how you call yourself. I had a discussion with a homegirl online about terms, like this Kamala Harris thing. Some people saying she's not black. Some people saying she is. And I'm saying she's all those things. But if you got to understand the difference between culture, race, ethnicity, religion, these are all terms in sociology. They all play a role. For instance, religions tend to evolve around the culture that's using them. So that's why you have certain religions split off into their own culture, because it's hard to rep a religion that doesn't rep your culture or that doesn't help your culture or doesn't relate. Like it's hard to put apply a cultural issue um, it's hard to rep up, apply a religious issue um, from a hundred million years ago into a society that it didn't wasn't meant for. So, like, I'm not gonna get too deep into that, but that's for anything. So, it's hard to understand hyphy in New York where there's no hyphy, there's no donuts, there's no <laughs> you can't do a sideshow in New York. Trust me, you can barely pull a blunt out in New York, like unless you're in the hood or the project. Like, you can't just. I remember pulling a blunt out in Manhattan and getting tackled damn near by my homie because apparently they don't, they're not as cool with that out there. Like not saying people don't smoke, but the way that cops and stopped and frisk and it's not the same, but like in the Bay, we do that all day. We just, you know, it's cultural. So I can't say, oh, they're wrong. And they can't say we wrong. It's just, you got to learn. That's why they say when in Rome. So uh, one thing is the, the great migration, uh, most, I think 50% plus of black people in America, and some people argue that Africans were here already. Some people argue all kinds of things, you know, where the indigenous came from, the Bering Strait, they crossed from, from these areas in, in the East or whatever. You know, that's all discuss discussable. There's always, it's not like, there's views on things. It's not always, there's theories and hypotheses and, you know, some things you can call fact. You know, we ought to look, I think we need to look more loosely at what we call straight up truth. And everybody hashtag facts, but there's more, there can be more than one truth. Like people's like, is Kamala black? Is she Indian? She's all of those things. She's Indian. She's Asian. She's black. She's mixed. She's a woman of color. She's a woman. She's a DA. She was a senator. She was attorney general. Now she's vice president. People want people to lock in as these things, these one things. So if you understand the great migration of uh, that has to do with slavery, the South, the Civil War, basically uh, there were free, there are free blacks. And please stop calling black people and African people the slaves. Please don't call us, our, our ancestors, slaves. I know you don't do it on purpose, but we were people that were enslaved. That's important. These type of narratives are important. This is how we change narratives. We got to talk about these things, discover and discuss. Um, a lot of people don't understand this, is that when you say urban or the black community, this is part of what Ice Cube was saying. That a lot of times, you know, we say minority. We say, and I get it. There is a reason for that. People of color, minority. 
And all these things can get skewed and mixed in weird. Like it's it's a it's a deeper discussion of what that means, what's in of color. And there's reasons for that. There's the one drop rule. If you have one drop of black, you're black and you're not really allowed to be white or get the benefits. So that's not that's something was forced. A lot of uh cultural views are forced and they're forced through oppression, but they flip around. So then the later on you got somebody half black. And it's like, well, you're not black, but it's like, no, you said this made, this made me only black because I wasn't good enough to be your white son or your white daughter as a slave. So it's like, it can, you know, we have to own and empower ourselves. Like, you know, if Kamala says she a black woman, she had a black dad, then let it be. Like, all that, she ain't this and that is craziness. It's, ins it's insanity. It's African, it's, I mean, it's American insanity. America's supposed to be the most mixed place, but it's got the most ridiculous like views on a lot of these things. And so you need to, we need to listen to the immigrants, listen to the people, the people that things been forced on, people at the bottom. We need to listen to people who have had their histories rewritten and listen to learn, not get defensive and tell people what they are. Like people tell me, man, you need to stop talking this black, this Africa stuff, because you're American. We're all American. You need, we need to all come together as Americans. That's insulting. That's racist to me. Don't tell me I'm not African. Don't tell me I can't relate to my roots. Don't tell me I have to say I'm only American. Because some people, typically the nationalists and the most racist people say, I'm American and we want America great again, meaning we're the true Americans. Why is it that some people don't have to attach nothing to being American? They're just American. Who are those people usually? You feel me? So I sometimes say I don't want to be called African American. Just call me African, like Dead Prez, like my homie's Dead Prez. I'm an African. I'm an African, and I know what's happening. Now the reason I feel like uh, I, I it's a it's it's not it's not saying that. I, of course, obviously, I was born in America, and it's no disrespect to Africa as as, as in terms of like I, I haven't been or whatever. But we all can have roots. Like, since when do we not have roots? Like, if you're Asian and you live in America, yeah, you live in America and you still can say, I'm Asian. That's why they call you Asian American. Like, because you have a pride in having a history beyond America's bullshit. So I feel that's empowering for us. I feel it's empowering to say the real power is where you come from originally. Once I step off African American soil, I'm no longer a nigga. No longer. Like, if somebody can say it, but I show the hell ain't treated like one the same way I am in my own country. So if I want to be African, it's a reason they kept us from Africa and took us and didn't want us to go back, didn't want us to speak the languages. So I tell my African homies, don't take it as disrespect, but we want to reconnect, and, and we need it sometimes. We need to see a country full of Africans. Just like Oakland was, a, was like, I told my homie, I said, these black communities come from the Great Migration. Because the South was 50% of African Americans was in the South. So everybody who don't like South rap and talk about mumble rap and mad that Atlanta's popping, shame on you. Shame on you. Because that is the place where the, the worst black struggle was. Because that's where these so-called Americans fought to keep us enslaved. That's where they made billions and trillions of dollars off of our, our ancestors' labor. We're the top, most richest country in the world, still keeping poor whites. And I say that first because most people don't want to accept that. You know, a lot of these races be poor, like and ignorant, more uneducated than a lot of immigrants. And so we got to really speak on that, like poor whites, immigrants, uh, enslaved blacks, like stolen land and, and stolen labor is big. And, and that's what made us rich and have all these weapons. And that's when we talk about uh, respecting the flag and respecting America, that's what we're respecting. But, but those people aren't benefiting like that. We're the scapegoats. We're the ones in the filling the jails. We're the ones who, you know, we can't even rap in peace. We got to be called something else. We got to have rap affiliated and turned and, and seen as gangster activity or crime. It's a crime to even rap or just sometimes be black or be brown or or even defend, if you're not black, to even defend us to get you killed. They call it a N-I-G-Z something something lover. I don't want to go there because Facebook might even call that hate speech, even though I'm educating. 
But uh, so geography, migration, we started, a lot of us started, that all blacks are not from slavery. Just keep that again, that's another thing. Uh, you can come from Africa, you can come from Jamaica, you can come from, you can come from France, you can come from, there's black people everywhere, it's Africans everywhere. Like I'm in Seoul and there's hell of Africans here, there's hell of black people here. That's another thing, like we think in American terms a lot of times, there is a lot of African ownership. There's not one black poor person in Korea. Like I'm, I'm saying poor relatively, like how y'all think of us as as broke, poor, gangbangers, crack addicts, and the jokes and like baby mamas. There's no black baby mamas in Korea. There's none of them. There's not really none like that. Like you feel me? Like it's it's college students, it's families, it's rich people. It's no homeless black encampment, and like it's just something you had to understand that it's just a big world out there. So uh, migration point I was making was when we say urban. The reason we use that term urban or uh, black community, it all comes from the great migration from the South where blacks were enslaved and fought to get out of the South, fought to get out. I mean, well, the, the once, once slavery was supposedly over, there was more racism and oppression that's still going on today, right now. And you can find it in the prisons, the laws, uh, <clears throat> everything. You find it in every part of America. and. Uh, the, the migration was we once we got free, we could move around freely and start lives elsewhere, which it took us sometimes longer to rebuild. Because when we would go to these places and rebuild, like racist, angry whites would tear a lot of shit down, form laws and do other things to fuck us off, put our, our dads in jail, uh, hold our, you know, hold our families back, hold us back through bad education. Like, for instance, when, we, when my grandmother moved to Oakland, she tried to put my auntie in uh in private school, in Catholic school, and uh, a lot of teach white teachers quit and said that, you know, Catholic school should not be for blacks. So they they actually was a rule that black kids can't go to these Catholic schools. Now, if you know most, I'll speak for Oakland, private school and Catholic school is a huge, huge thing. Like they are, there are middle class blacks and like, my family, the Libri family, most of my cousins and stuff, I was a black sheep, but most of them went to Catholic schools and nice schools. But my grandmother fought for that. Like she face to face fought the school system. My grandma and I know Black Panther, like, you know what I mean, Angela Davis, but she was she was Adam. Like, man, my, my daughter's going here. And guess what? My auntie became one of the most powerful black business women in America. She was on Time Magazine. You know what I'm saying? My, my dad's older sister. You know, I got her daughter is, is like a teacher in D.C. She's like the, the teacher of uh, the presidents and the government kids. She works at that school. You know what I'm saying? And I, I'm the black sheep of the family. And I'm in Korea with a rap label. And, uh, you know, I made, made good. My kids is doing good. Like, my, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not in the position I was in. Like, you know, I'm not on welfare no more and all that. So my point is look at one generation of fighting or two or three generations, we, we four generations, Oakland went from from fighting, <laughs> from being called the N-word, kicked out, the like asked to leave the neighborhood, can't get our kids in school, to the most powerful, one of the most powerful black women in America. We know that, you know, my family knows the, the, the Harris, Kamala Harris family and all that. Like, but then I got, I, my other side of the family, we had a lot of struggles too. My, my, my mom's mom knew, was best friends with Maya Angelou and got it out the mud with Maya Angelou. So I'm just saying with a little opportunity, a little time and a little knowledge and a little a little fight, it ain't given that fight. Look what grand, grandson done. Look what great grandkids. And I'm speaking this for all y'all, like all of this. So look at that. Look at the history of slavery, the Civil War, the Great Migration and how the North, they used to call it the North where you can be free, but still blacks weren't free, free. They were like still oppressed but they had more freedom. And then you had whites up there that was more like, well, we don't like the whites down there because they're on some slavery shit and we're trying to be upper class and kind of be on some, some higher level shit. So like you also got a, a connection between the people in those areas, black, whatever color together. Cause they're like, man, we're not like those people in the South. So my point is, it's a reason rap circulated back to the South, what we call trap now. You know, trap ain't nothing but street music, man. It ain't, 
it, it, it's a different sound, a different era. Mumble rap is, is to me, it's a racist term. It's it's a term like backpack rap or gangster rap. It's not they're not all racist, but they're some of them are cloaked in just a they're blanket statements. Mumble rap is like okay, you used to like this rapper and you liked it the way these rappers rapped and you liked it this style and you knew this slang back then because you was younger. Or you from New York. What What's mumble rap? Ghostface, Ghostface Killer and Wu-Tang was mumble rap to me because I didn't know what the hell they was talking about. But I loved them. I love them to death. But what the hell was they talking about to me? That's my favorite. That was one of my favorites. But like all my Oakland homies from the hood would be like, man, what the hell are they saying? Because we don't talk like that. Like, just like uh, when Too Short came out, and it's different types of rappers in Oakland, they were like, man, that rap is not like New York rap, so we don't like it. Because he's not talking about New York. You feel me? And so it's like we get we get like that sometimes. It's like, you know, mumble rap is Southern slang. And it's funny because everyone talks like Lil Wayne now. Everyone talks like... Atlanta now. It used to be everyone talk like New York. So you got West Coast motherfuckers talking about, what's up, son? What's up, God? You don't know the history of that. That's the uh, Five Percenters. Five Percenters are a, a spinoff religious group, kind of a, a certain spiritual group, mostly East Coast. That's where you get your Nas slangs and your, your Wu-Tangs and your Rakims and Lord Jamar's. People dissing Lord Jamar for some of his views, but that's all Five Percenter views. Like, Black Power, uh, the numbers, it's all in the raps. Listen to Nas, listen to uh, God and Sun and the Moon, Erica Badu, the people y'all call woke. It's all the same. It's all the same thing. You got to learn it. It's not the rappers and artists' job to fix it for you. Like, you know, I always laugh when I hear the homies from the from the West talking about, what's up, son? Usually they're a little older and they grew up on East Coast rap. But what Sun means, it's like I so I call my Wu Tang. I call my homie son because he shine like one. You get what I'm saying? So we saying and repeating a lot of things. Don't know what it means. The West Coast. We had Oakland in the Bay, NorCal's a lot of slang. A lot of, a lot of. We got our own slang. So how can we call somebody mumble rap? Like when, you don't understand what we saying. Like I say, I, I call my New York homie. Uh, his his name is uh, Copy Koo. He's from the Bronx. One time we did a song together. And that's a, that's a whole nother story, man. Shout out Copy Cool to Passion. He's down with, he's been a Bronx like legend for years, man. We brought him to the Bay. He was rocking with this Latin. See, shit like that. I meet this dude in Denver. We end up rocking in the Bronx projects. And we did a song called Oakland to the Bronx. Next thing I know, he in the Bay with this Latin, with the, with, the, with the Latin homies out here. And I'm like, see, that's a circulation. Now, when he go back to New York, he like, man, them Bay motherfuckers, man, they held me down. Just like when I went to New York, he held me down. But it's like, is there East Coast, West beef? No, nah, that was L.A. That was bad boy, death row beef. And it was more, a little more, but it was, L.A. was more on that. L.A. versus these certain New York. It's not East versus West. Oakland and Bay wasn't really in on that. Philly wasn't in on that. You know what I'm saying? Too Short did a song with Eric Sermon at that time. So... <clears throat> Anyway, uh, uh, I'll, I'll probably I'll probably wrap up with this, but uh, I was talking to uh, I was talking to Passion or the, or, or Copy Coop, and uh, what was I talking about? Re oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He sent me this. We, he sent me a verse or something, or I sent him a verse, and then he sent me the song. And we, it's like, what you think? And I'm like, man, I already knew he was tight, so I wasn't even. I didn't feel I had to say nothing. So he's like, yeah. it's like he already tight. So he's like, so I said, I said that. I said, man, it was tight, bro. It was tight. He said, oh, uh, what? He's like, what? I said, it was tight. He said, hold on, what you said? You tight? See, in New York, when you say you tight, that means you mad. You're not feeling something or it's whack. So he thought I said it had me tight. And so he he was like, hold on. And I said, no, out here, tight means the shit was dope. We like it. It's, I'm feeling it. And so... uh the South, if you listen hard and want to learn something, yeah, there's a different style of music right now. It, it, it's it's a lot less about uh, clarity and and uh, explicit talk. Like it's a little more abstract, and that goes for and and that goes for the rap style, the concepts of how they make songs a little different, 
and it goes for the uh, the way songs are structured. Like before, we would have the beat, the song. Like we would have like the structure would be kind of you know a four bar intro, you know sixteen bars, eight bar hook. You know if you really want to get funky, you come with the little four bar, a bar, or a bar bridge, and you switch it up. Like you know you switch the song up for a minute, but. Um, you know, and then you have your outro, you talk a little shit at the end. But now shit is, these producers, it's totally different. There's all over the place. Like it might be four bars of this beat and then two bars of this, and then the hook might be 10 to like 16 bars. And they might do four bars of verse, but the verse ain't a verse, it's them singing. And then it's like somebody will come in and double time rap the, and double time rap is normal now. It's like it's not really they call it the Migo flow, but it's really double time or the or the uh the um bone did the flow. A lot of people did the flow. Freestyle fellowship. It's a normal part of rapping, but it's just that I say it's more synonymous with the Midwest. But it's different because of how they do it now. It's like I, I'm up on the stroke, I'm up on the stroke. But now I'm going to go. It's like they pause. It's like they doing everything. They a little bit of everything. They sing for a minute. There's a little bit of bone. Then you speed it up. There's a little bit of it. A little bit of spice one. Then they stop for a minute and rap slow. A little bit of too short. Then you, then the cat might throw in a crazy metaphor, like a little bit of Wu-Tang. And then nigga slangs is all mixed up. It's like you can't tell. So everything is all more mixed up because we got the internet. Everybody like got different stuff you can add to the pot now so uh it's just you gotta be open-minded and like you might not even be a rap fan like you don't even have to be a rap fan but if you are a hip-hop fan or you know like you might not like this vibe or that vibe that's fine but there, like i said there's two sides there's the there's the there's the fan in you and the the art side and then there's the the uh the sociology side of just understanding like, don't just hate on trap rap without understanding the origins. What is it? Some, like David Banner said, a big part of trap rap that gets hated on why it's called mumble rap, because you ain't from the South. You don't, you don't know what they're saying. You don't understand. So if if you did feel, say, that Kodak Black was kind of hard to understand, that's Florida talk. That's Florida slang. And... If you want to talk uh, history, you know, a lot of places in the South did not have the best schools, did not have the best uh, support system for these kids. So if a, if a Wayne or a Kodak get out and make something of themselves, like, is that uh, something to, 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 to shame or something to, like, be like, well, they did pretty good for themselves if Wayne's daughter's in college and that man got a degree. He got straight A's in high school. Did you? I'm just saying. He's he's he's. I'm not I'm not saying every every single thing I agree with, but like if you don't like the violence in certain music, you gotta understand this is what happened. The man got the man shot himself at 14. He had a baby at 14, he got married at 14. Like you can't just look at now and just say silly things. Like these is real people who've been through stuff, just like you. Like I'm not gonna walk in your house and be like, well, why is this why is that patch of paint missing from your door? Or why does your mom talk like that? Or like, why is it your car is missing is missing a tire? Or like, come on, man. Like this is if you if I can't help fix your tire or fix your car up, I'm not gonna speak on it. Or I might ask, hey man, like your your roof missing. <laughs> what's good? Like what's happening? Like what's going on? You okay? If I ain't asking if you're okay, and if we ain't just shooting the shit, like I'm not really big on the whole hating on everybody. Like, haters don't prosper. Um, I don't know, man. I've been, I've gone over time. This is stuff I wanted to shop it up. Um, this is my own little world in hip hop to, uh, this is really what Mr. Network, Mr. Network is about. Like, it's helped me make sense of the world and connect with people. So these conversations I'm just having, these are based on conversations, real experiences as, as a, as a rapper. I'm big on, uh, people getting to speak on things that they actually been through. Like it's different than being an observer. Like there's a lot of hip hop scholars who read the books and they have a, a, a follow, they follow a narrative that's popular in there. Like you got your gangster rap narrative of like, oh yeah, the hood rap is what's important. And then you got your, uh, your conscious rap narrative. 
I'm none of those things. And I think that's what what makes me represent my city. And that's part of the culture of Oakland's hip hop and Bay hip hop. We kind of a mix. We got it. We, we, that's why we wasn't East Coast, West Coast beef. We listen to everybody, but we value our independent artists as much as we value uh, a superstar rapper. And we value different types of styles. You know what I'm saying? That's why I was influenced by Short. My favorite group is Souls of Mischief. I was influenced by uh, Boots. Tupac was also influenced by Oakland. Biggie was influenced by Oakland. Like, I was influenced by Brooklyn. I was influenced by Atlanta. I was influenced by Seattle. I mean, and, you know, the Bay influenced Seattle. There's these little routes that, that you can find. Like, I didn't realize Northern Northwest was really uh, more connected to Northern Cali rap than Southern Cali rap. And if you look at the map, it makes sense because if you from Portland or uh, Seattle, you're closer to Northern Cali and to see it for yourself. So some of our music, musicians were, were really getting a lot of love up there. And so I was like, dang, it seemed like the Northwest messed with, New York, with uh, Bay Rap more than, uh, more than LA does. But you would think because it's California, it wouldn't be. But it, see, if you, if you measure the LA and the Bay scenes, the reason is of of how they relate is a little different because it's more like big brother, little brother with LA. But sometimes the little brother comes with the ideas. Sometimes the little brother be, you feel me? Like the little brother be mellow and the other older brother be Lonzo. Like no disrespect, but I'm just saying it happens that way. Like Lonzo probably put hands on Melo and, and, be, and, and cross him up and, Hit Jay's in his face and, and 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 keep him in line or whatever. It had a bigger. He came out first. He he you know he got the the notoriety first. But then Melo might come out and be just on one. And Melo might be the real Hooper though. You just never know. You know what I'm saying? So in, in other words, overall, different regions share with each other and share ideas. It's not all conflict. It's not all uh, East versus West. Everyone versus South and. Like, you know, there was this point where it was like everything's focused on New York. And that I think that was a part of the energy of the East Coast West, because some people felt like New York wasn't open to other regions. And I'm not saying I even felt that way because, man, I got the dumbest amount of love in New York. But I understand because I used to be such a big New York fan. I feel like a lot of times underground regions and, and regional areas don't always get that love. They don't always get that uh, that history, uh, get locked into history correctly. Being from a place that's influenced the game so much and seeing how sometimes our, our contribution is known in the underground, but it's not really mentioned in the major media. Sometimes that's simple as media has different owners, different, uh, different people run different media, different people, uh, you know, all media is not controlled by the people. You know what I'm saying? Some media is bought. Like, uh, I, I'm going to end uh, probably on the two hours exactly. It's 150. I got about two minutes probably. <clears throat> um, if there's any questions, anybody still watching, I don't even know. But uh, I'll tell y'all this. One thing uh, about media is a lot of what we believe is from media and advertising. It's not from our own organic beliefs. And one thing hip hop has done for me and many is it's, it's about challenging yourself to think for yourself and actually think, not just think in narratives of what people saying. I'm trying to hope that if anything you get from this, everything you heard from me is, or, or hearing from me is challenging ideas as opposed to reinforcing ideas like that you are forced to believe. Like, you know, I, I, I everybody will be like, MC Hammer went broke. I'm like, nah, he never went broke. Y'all thought that because of the media. Like, it hammers my homie. Like, he ain't broke. He never was. No, when you got this much and you might spend too you got to go this much, you might be have less, but the media just runs with it. And it's like, oh, yeah, this, you know, this, I see the media say all kind of stuff, and I know these people in real life. And I'm like, huh? And then I meet somebody, and they'll be like, still laughing about Hammer in 2020, and this man owned, Twitter, owned part of Twitter and sitting courtside at the Warrior game, and it's people that be like, oh, so when are you going to actually make it somewhere as a rapper? I'm like, huh? I was somebody as a rapper at 14. What is you talking about? <laughs> but that's how narratives work. 
So uh, I think my final point uh, was about, uh, oh, man, what was I saying I was going to end on? I was talking about uh, narratives, migration. Uh, oh, just uh, just 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 keep in mind that uh, there's different sides of the story. There's there's the media view, and then there's the like story you gotta dig. That's what sociologists and anthropologists do. They dig up stuff. They look up stuff. They find things and dig into the story. I mean, you can call that. That's a little different than media and journal. Like journalists, actually, they dig into stories too. But sometimes a media and press is just repeating stories, which is different. You know what I'm saying? You're going to get the real stories from people who've been there and around it. And all of y'all in a way are like anthropologists. And so everyone can be a sociologist because no one can tell you the things, what about the things you, you saw and did. But we can also learn how to interpret the things that we see and do. It's like, it's different interpretations of what we see and do. You know, they say, believe half of what you see and none of what you hear. Or uh, sometimes it's just, we gotta look at it more deeply. And, uh, and I'm big on context. I'm not big on, uh, oh, it's just like this. No, what does that mean? What is that about? Like, where are you coming from when you say that? So uh, I'm gonna just uh, probably, I'm gonna probably wrap it up. Um, I'm gonna be doing more workshops like this. I had a, I had a good time. I hope people uh, got something out of this. We gonna show. Uh, I'll show you these last things. I got this new video. Uh, I got this album coming out. The follow up to my biggest album is called Mr. Network Part One. It's a three part trilogy. So we are gonna drop part two real soon. This is the first single called Up, uh, uh, produced by Sean Black. We shot the video in Tokyo last year. Uh, before, like right before the COVID, I was out here when uh, Corona started last year. It didn't start in uh, Korea. It started in China since uh, ignorant presidents want to say the Kung flu and all that. Just to be clear, I was in Asia, but I was not in China. But it did start to spread around around uh, January. And I was out here that whole time. I came back in March. No, February, I came back to the U.S. And uh, boom, it hits hard and I came back to a whole new world and then the lock the lockdown came. So uh this is the second single. It's called Be Myself. It's a film, a short film slash music video I shot also around the same time I shot up. So this is the second single. Um we're finishing up that film right now. Um I actually got a meeting to go uh work on the the trip the trailer and introduction. Um but this is a really interesting movie because it's it's a sociological view somewhat of some of the, the hip-hop scene in Seoul mixed with the Bay Area and the Oakland and the uh, Northern Cali that I'm bringing to Seoul. So like it's a, a little movie about how I move around and like the Mr. Network's concept of what, I, like I said, I do the same things wherever I go, but it's kind of connected to multiple regions and like it's kind of a mix between music, music business, which are not the same, music and art, and the art business, if you don't, if you get two things out of this, remember that you got there two different studies. Being an artist will help you be better at the business, but there, I know people who are terrible at the business and amazing artists, and I know amazing business people who are terrible artists. And the best I would say is to be in the middle. If you want to be independent and have a, a career at it, which you need some business to to. Most of it, they're not lying when they say 90% is business. But anyway, I'm really excited about releasing this. Sometimes I have so much music business to do, I don't get as much time to enjoy the art. And that's really the foundation. I love being an artist. I love making music, uh, writing, writing, not just raps, books, movies. Like I'm really into it, taking pictures. Like I, I really like looking at what other artists do, even the art of activism and, uh, promoters and like people who even push the art. It's interesting to watch. It's an art to a lot of things. Uh, but anyway, first two singles, I got some other new singles, uh, Baby Love. I'm releasing singles because the album's not 100% done, but uh, I'm releasing singles right now because uh, I need to finish up the last few songs and I'm out here. So it's COVID, it's harder to get certain shit moving. Uh, hit me up, I got stickers. Delibri stickers, and uh, if you need promo and stuff like that, you need help getting affordable promo 
or if you want to tap in with the artist, uh, getting involved in the community as an artist, um, you know, hit me up. I'm, I'm one of the National People Hip Hop Congress. Hit Rocky, uh, hit Auburn Hip Hop Congress if you're if you're local in that area, um, and we can help you kind of get stuff moving or get, you know try to put you in the right direction. I'm always tangible. Um, I appreciate it. I got hats, clothing. Um, and if you need to connect with certain artists or whatever, or you're trying to get shows or stuff like that, like I would like to be a resource. Um, but yeah, Mr. Network 2, look for it. I'm dropping a whole bunch of music next year um, and this and a little bit this year. Mr. Network 2 featuring uh, Bun B from UGK, a, my favorite rapper, A Plus from Souls of Mischief, Akil from Jurassic 5, my son Booster Vu is on there, uh, Stick Man from Dead Prez on there. Turf Talk from Sick With It Records, uh, the whole Rendezvous Records crew, they're all on there. And this is going to be my best work to date. So I really hope y'all get to check it out. Um, also, shout out to the label, the crew, Rendezvous Records. Everybody's dropping uh, stellar projects. And uh, hopefully we'll get the, oh, not hopefully, we're going to drop the group album next year, uh, August 21st, Rendezvous. That's going to be the title. So shout out to the crew, Raman Jamal. He just dropped the album Book of Ra, his debut solo album. YDMC just dropped uh, Rap Forever in Pieces. Um, he just dropped that album featuring Tech Nine, Insane Clown Posse, Meet Myself, his group 3HD, Three Headed Dragon, uh, and Young Buck from G Unit is on there. Madman, Welcome Me to the World is out. He got another one called Ain't No Second Guessing. Kiana Salinas dropping the Anomaly album, the first, the first lady of rendezvous records um and then who else we got three-headed dragon the group within uh kind of like how you got souls in, in high road they're a group within the crew called uh three-headed dragon they dropping scorched earth and then uh b jada has a whole bunch of albums i think his solo album is dropping called diamond and then he's got one called east palo oakland with the homie zelly mac and i think that's the whole oh benny roth newell um, Big Murph, he's got a project product out called uh, uh, The Underdog. He does a lot of um, band work. So if you need a, a piano player or a song composer, you know, he's in a whole bunch of bands. He's touring the world. And uh, James the Spitter, he's our, he's, he's our, he's our hit maker, man. He got all the club bangers and, uh, he, you know, he really tight, t tight with the Latin crowd. He's, he's killing it, killing it. So he's got a whole bunch of singles out. You can check those out. You can go to dlabrie.com to find us. Join our mailing list. Uh, follow me on Instagram at DLabrie, Snapchat DLabrie ELG, and subscribe to that YouTube. Rocky keep posting it, and I appreciate it. But yeah, if it ain't no more questions, man, I'm gonna slide out. Um, I got samplers. Anybody who emails me or or, or social media's me from this workshop, um, I give you my email: rdvbiz rdvbiz one at gmail. Or Instagram me at DLabri, Snapchat DLabri LG, tweet me at DLabri. Um, is that all of them? Facebook me, DLabri. Like me on Facebook. Um, hit the website. Any way you find me on social media, I got a free sampler for you. And I'll send you uh, the flyers with it. And uh, that'll just be for me to you. Just send me your, uh, your information and we'll either mail it out or we'll send you the digital files. That's on, that's on, that's on. How, how, did, how my young homie said, that's on God. That's on God. You feel me? Nah. But anyway, man, it's been my pleasure. I really appreciate you. Shout out Auburn Hip Hop Congress, Nat, uh, Rocky. Y'all been beautiful. It's great to connect. I can't wait to reconnect and come out there to Nevada City, see y'all again, and uh, hopefully do some shows in the future. I hope everybody's doing okay in these pandemic times. Uh, it's, it's not easy. But uh, use the time wisely and try to try to use it to better yourself and, uh, and strengthen yourself and use this time because we always so busy. You know, I, I can't put a price on the time to uh, unwind and to find myself and uh, reconnect with family and reconnect with friends. And, you know, it's just a, something about it's, it's We're different people when we're not busy. We're different people when we're not in a rush and we're not 100 percent consumed with running around and keeping up in survival and even capitalism survival is a different kind of kind of, I've been in both. I've been in the, the hood survival to the, you know, to the, to the young man survival, you know, now I'm business owner, you know, father survival. Like I'm not like, you know what I'm saying? Homeless and 
living out the car like I used to. Like, like you know, it's I'm not begging to get her as a rapper or begging for a five dollars, two dollars CD. <clears throat> but you know, I do I do understand even no matter what you know, even when you're good, capitalism keep you hustling and running around like to where you can feel like you ain't doing enough or you ain't you you were you a check away or. You know, like I might feel like I'm chilling now because I'm not in the U.S. right now. I'm kind of like, you know, in a place where I can I can chill. But like, you know, it's still it's still we all we all like a step away from some a tragedy or whatever. So, you know, just just value the time and and, if, and always look at the fact and always look with gratitude because you just never know. Like You never know how uh, how bad it can get until it get that bad. So blessings to everyone. Uh, shout out to my son, Booster Vu. Check out his music. He's also the co-founder of Rendezvous Records. Rendezvous, his name's Devu. You know what I'm saying? So I made this label with him, you know, and when he grew up, was, the plan was to give it to him. So, uh, yeah, man, shout out to the whole family, the whole uh, 530. Shout out J. Ross Pirelli, Kirk, King Kirk, um, and all the great artists out there. Uh, Augustus Delafin, I haven't seen you in a while. Man, who else? Uh, Odap. Um, man, all the homies that was in the, the Golden Gloves group that I ain't seen in a while. Uh, man, what's my man name? Uh, man, uh, you know, you know what I'm talking about, man. I love y'all guys. I love y'all ladies out out there that always show love, man. All my friends and fam out that way, much love. Audrey, Audrey, appreciate you. Um, anybody else? All the little youngsters that came up with Congress, the grandkids, the kids, you know, much love. Um, Sacramento, Scourge, Big Man, everybody who who supported. Rest in peace to my grandmother who passed on Mac Road, and shout out to everybody making moves. Uh, tap in. We'll be out in in, uh, in Asia for a while, but we'll be back soon. So uh, much love, man. D. Labrie out.